Joining me now in the next Phil School podcast, uh, one of our favorite returning guests, uh, not only because he is uh, a very good person to talk to about the Knicks, but because he is one of the few people I get to talk to on this podcast who um, watches the entire league and writes about the entire league uh, very, very well, I might add, for his Substack newsletter, Last Night in Basketball, of which I am a proud subscriber. Uh, Jared Dubin, hello, sir. How are you? I'm doing all right, man. How are you? I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. I know where we're, we... This episode, I don't think, is posting until Friday morning. So we're we're otherwise, I would have done um, some some finals talk with you. But I will just say that sitting here recording this at four oh seven p.m. on uh, on on oh wait, sorry, yeah, Friday. T- tomorrow's I my sorry, my days are all mixed up. Tomorrow is Thursday, but the finals start tomorrow, right? Yeah, tomorrow night, Thursday night. Okay, this is how this is my week. I thought today was Thursday. I thought the finals were starting tonight, and I thought tomorrow was Friday. This is where we're at. When there's like a week off in between games, it's really easy to lose track of time. Like, I don't even remember when the last game was at this point. I guess, what was it, like last Wednesday or something? It was crazy. It's weird because it feels like the NBA season is over. And yet it's obviously not over because there's still the, the most important thing to be played. So you know what? We will do a little finals talk maybe at the end of the episode. Um, but what I was what I was going to say is like, I'm excited for the finals. Uh, you know, I'm completely I'm like I've moved past whatever disappointment lingered on from the Knicks uh, losing and, and process all that. And uh, yeah, I'm just excited for for there to be one more round and what I expect will be an entertaining series, which you have been writing about again for your for your excellent newsletter. Um, but let's save talk of that for later because this is a Knicks podcast. So we'll we'll do some Knicks stuff, um, and then maybe we'll branch out. So I was re rereading actually your. So I love that for your newsletter you did um, these. <laughs> have a good summer every time someone got yeah. eliminated, um, and you kind of summarized the Knicks exit and i was reading it today um and what i was struck by is like you have uh, a list of offseason priorities for every team and you had your offseason priorities list for the knicks and it's not like you know they need to they must you know get their star this summer because of salary cap reasons or like they must upgrade this this position or that that position you you basically like went through like See who you could like extend Brunson. Obviously, if you could do that, great. Like bring back OG, bring back Hardenstein. You know, don't don't punt on your draft picks like you've been doing for you know some of the frequent or recent drafts. And I guess I want to start there. Like in the moment, we could get caught up in how much fun a season is and how special this team in particular felt. But then, kind of time goes by, and you're like, all right, well, maybe maybe there's more that we need to address here than than maybe we initially thought. So. Do you still feel like, hey, listen, unless there is some like perfect ideal star that comes on the market that we are not expecting to come on the market as of right now, like the best thing they could do is kind of like, yeah, try to clean up around the edges, make some good draft picks and run it back next year. I mean, I think they should always be on the lookout for whoever the star guy is. Like if there's a way they can upgrade whichever spot they feel like they need to upgrade in, you know, in the starting lineup or in terms of their ability to create offense, which I think in the last couple of years has been the the most significant issue in the playoffs, whether, you know, last year it was for a variety of reasons this year it was because everybody got hurt but also i mean i remember the the last time i came on was right after uh the trade with the raptors and we had talked about how one of the things i said was they traded emmanuel quickly for the only guy i couldn't get mad at them for trading for it for trading him for because he was the best version of the exact guy that they needed but that there was going to come a time where they would miss quickly playmaking, you know, particularly in those series where teams pressured Brunson all the way up the court, which is like exactly what happened in the two series in the playoffs. So I think that in particular, like whether it's secondary playmaking or a backup point guard or whatever it is, like somebody that else that can create offense for someone other than himself, I think is really important. And, you know, people will say, well, that's Randall. I think we've seen Randall, the way Randall bends the defense doesn't work the same way in the playoffs that it does in the regular season. That's not to say he's not good, but I do think there is something different 
to having someone who can penetrate off the dribble from the outside as opposed to from you know the mid poster or something like that or getting getting post ups and bend the defense that way it's a little bit different so that's something i would still be looking for but i, I wouldn't like the, the big names that I think have been out there are Donovan Mitchell and Carl Towns. And for me, Mitchell is still not the guy for the same reason. He wasn't the guy for me two summers ago. Um, I, I don't like the two small guards thing. I don't, um, I don't think that he's a guy whose presence by itself makes you a contender, which would be sort of my baseline for, for what they should be trading for at this point. And then Towns, I'm just not, really a towns guy he's he's got obviously incredible skill but just because of how much not anxiety i have enough of that to begin with but like <laughs> heartburn it would give me to watch him play on the knicks i can't advocate for it it's so funny you just said that because like i, I don't know what made me think of this today like you know the, the tweet i mean shout out to new york basketball a great twitter account is like the best aggregation account on on the internet um he sends out the tweets like or she i should say we, we, it's he's anonymous person who owns that account sends out like tweets ahead of Knicks games like smile your Knicks play today and every time i see one of those i'm like no that's not how it works for me I, it's <laughs> like your Knicks play today get ready for 12 hours of anxiety and stress followed by uh a, a day of being a zombie because you didn't sleep. So yeah, we're New Yorkers. <laughs> first of all, the anxiety is always going to be there. Like we're in New York, so that means that, like it's a heavy Jewish population like me. So the anxiety is going to be even it's more. <laughs> like, <laughs> come on. So well, let's talk about towns. Like, because I want to look. I just spent two straight days on newsletters on town on Carl Anthony Towns, and I did that not because I am a Carl Anthony Towns advocate, but for the reason that you literally just said, like. There are two. It, but let's put Paul George aside. We can come back to Paul George actually, if you want to. Although I think that's probably that's a two lane street, and it might turn into a one lane street if if the Clippers like decide to pony up the money. Um, but like the two names that are fully out there, right, are Donovan Mitchell and and Carl Anthony Towns. I'm with you on Mitchell, where like, and it's funny because there were a whole set of concerns two years ago. And then, and now it's like kind of a different set of concerns. And I just keep coming back to the fact that, like, you, it takes like special types of players who are, who want to be offense, like ball dominant players who want to have the ball in their hands to like be able to s seamlessly mesh their games together. And I think there has been something about, and this is not to say that Brunson is not a much I, I, I mean, this is not to disparage Darius Garland. Darius Garland's a really good player. I think Brunson is a much better player than Darius Garland. But like the fact that the the Mitchell and Garland backcourt has worked, I don't want to say worked so poorly because they've won a bunch of games. But like, there's nothing about them where you're like, there's a hole that's being like the sum of the parts. It, you know, the hole is greater than that. And I I don't know if I'm being unfair to their respective abilities and like willingness to sacrifice to win, but I. Something about Brunson and Mitchell doesn't excite me either, and I, I can't quite put my finger on it. Maybe you could elucidate it better than I can. Yeah, I think the the whole not adding up to the sum of his parts or not being greater than the sum of his parts is a good point. Like either one of those, I think, would apply. I think throughout his career, like even early in his career when he was in Utah, and Ricky Rubio at first was their point guard. Oh, there was a stretch when he that. was out. And Mitchell essentially played point guard. And I remember during that stretch writing like, hey, Donovan Mitchell, just keep the ball in his hands. He's actually a point guard, even if he's not like a prototypical distributor type and looks for his own offense, you know, significantly more often than he's looking to create for other players. Like, I just think he's at the best when the ball in his hands the most often. And I think that's true to a certain degree with Brunson, although he's shown more willingness and more ability to play off of another guy. But I think, yes. I think it's better for Brunson in a similar way that it is for Kyrie. If that guy is like a big wing rather than another smaller guard. hundred percent. Um, I just, that's just a considerably better fit to me. And then when Mitchell got traded to Cleveland, I wrote something about this too, just the history of being able to build good defenses with two guards that are like six, one, six, two, or shorter is just not very long. I remember you wrote about that. It, yeah, you, you have to go back to the Pistons, right? In like the, the late eighties. 
I had gathered the data in anticipation of the Knicks trading for Mitchell. Um, and then I just spun it because Garland is also, I think he's like 6'1", 6'2". So it's like the, the teams that had good defenses with those short guards are basically like the 80s Pistons, like you mentioned. Um, a couple of Jazz teams with Mitchell and Mike Conley because they had Rudy Gobert. And then the Raptors because they had their two small guards were Kyle Lowry and Fred Van Vliet, who were both really good defenders. And I don't think you can say that. Like, I don't think either Brunson or Mitchell is necessarily killing you on defense, but neither of them is the kind of guy that you're going to want to put on, you know, the best perimeter option on the other team. And even if you say, well, the Knicks have OG to do that. Well, now you're asking Brunson or Mitchell to guard much bigger guys, potentially both of them. It's just, it's, it's difficult for me to imagine that being the best fit. And even taking it a step further, like, and I was going to get into this with you later. We get into a little bit now. I, I do think that we, during like a playoff run, have a tendency to like overrate or overdo the whole like, well, wh- you know, what can we take from these playoffs? Like, what what are teams doing that are working, and let's apply it to our teams. But it is tough to shake the notion that the league is just getting bigger. And it's like it's this combination of size. Like, how much size can you get on the floor at once while maintaining your level of skill? And like, to, so with with the given that like there is going to be a six one six two whatever he is, you know, Jalen Brunson like guard on your t- team for thirty eight forty forty. You know, who the, who the hell am I kidding? It's Thibodeau forty five. You know, minutes a game in the playoffs. Like with that, it, with that as a given, like why? Are you going to sign up for a like to to, ha, to to have mortgage everything to bring in another small guy? So we're we're on the same page with Mitchell. But the thing is, it's getting bigger specifically on the perimeter, where ball handlers are bigger now. You need more big wing defenders. Like I wrote something early in this season about the rise of the tall ball handler, how more teams are putting the ball in, in the hands of guys that are bigger. Whether you know the the lead ball handlers in the league have gone from being guys that were like. 6'2 to 6'5 to guys that are 6'6 six, six to 6'8, six, or I can't remember the exact numbers I used. And the site I wrote it for doesn't exist anymore, so nobody will be able to check on that. But so, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that I think that's that's a really good point about how the league is becoming bigger. And I think specifically being bigger on the perimeter is something that matters. I think that's something that matters a lot. Like, look at the Celtics, you know? Like, Drew Holiday is a big dude for a, a guard. Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, those guys are big wings. The Knicks basically didn't have a big wing until they traded for OG. And unless you want to count Bogdanovich, he's really the only one that they have. And I think getting even smaller is it's it's dicey unless you can make up for it in the right ways. It can't. I don't. I mean, again, is it maybe it's coincidence that there are two teams in the finals that like it's just Kyrie Irving who's the only the only, you know the only, typically size and build guard and like you can't really bully Kyrie in the way that you could like bully some other guys his his height because he's just like that's he's when he tries he's, he's pretty good and he's been trying a lot um 30 second detour where are you at on Josh Giddy? not necessarily for the Knicks but just like in general because I know you paid a lot of attention to the Thunder this year yeah I mean I'm on they probably should have traded him before his value cratered when they were in the playoffs but if you're another team, because like what you just said about perimeter size, he's like, you know, he's like a big. I can see it for a team that has a, like a lead ball handler already where he can be like a like a Jalen Rose kind of player where he's your secondary Ooh. sort of ball handler. That's interesting. And, but the issue is you can't shoot. So beating closeouts isn't really a thing. But the, the skill set is, is at least somewhat similar where he could be your secondary ball handler and he can run like your bench units and whatnot, but he can't shoot and he's not going to get into the post. So he's got to develop one of those two skills. Yeah. It, it's, it's, you'd be surprised how many uh, newsletter subscribers have like reached out to me. Like, what about Giddy? Like, you know, cause they don't have to trade him. And I'm like, Oh, do you really, given what you're going to have to, I, to say nothing of the fact that I don't know Thunder want anything the Knicks have, but like given also, what you would have to um, off court concerns. And some some of some of those, uh, we'll just leave that there. Uh, back to back to the Knicks. So Towns, um, I'm. I don't want to say I'm like. 
fast. I'm not fascinated by the idea of Towns because we've, we're nine years into this player's career. There, there is no idea of Towns. The player is the player. Like we know what this guy is. We know what he's not. I am interested in the potential thought process of a team who is looking at this guy who has a very defined skill set and very defined at this point, you have to say inconsistencies. And like, you kind of, you kind of know what you're getting and you also know what you're going to have to pay for it. Um, maybe not in terms of assets, which I, that part I do find interesting. Like how, like who's asking for picks. If like you, you're acquiring a guy who's set to make whatever towns is set, set to make in a few years. Um, <laughs> But just like you, you know, you, 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 you'd kind of know what it is. And like he could do things for you that are hard to come by, you know, just like the obviously the, the four spacing and you, you know, can, how much can you get away with playing with the five? Like what, what do you need to make that work? So I'm, I'm intrigued by it. And I just know the rumor is going to come up with the next because of all, all the obvious reasons. I don't know. I, I like talk me out of why I should at least why I should be intrigued other than the fact that it's going to give you anxiety. I think there is reason to be intrigued. Like in the games where Towns is playing his best, it would be incredible. Like oh, the, yeah. the spacing element that he brings, those games where he is cooking in the post and he's seeing the doubles and making the pass early. He's a really good passer. When he does that, it's the times where he, you know, waits and dribbles himself into traffic and does all those kind of things. Like the skill set is like, what if you made Randall offensively like 10, 15% better at everything? Like that's the kind of skill set we're talking about with Towns at his best. But the problem is he, he doesn't reach that best often enough and the times where he doesn't the damage that he does i think is bad enough that it's really hard to live with whether it's the fouls or the disappearing from the offense or the weaknesses he brings as a defender um because tibbs isn't going to play him at center he can't protect the rim so he's going to have to play at the four I, I've been thinking a lot about that and I'm my I agree with you that if they got him they would get him I think predominantly well I don't want to get into a whole salary cap thing but it would be the likelihood of it of it being a Randall for Towns trade in some way shape or form is higher than the likelihood of it not being Randall involved in the trade so and again there are cap reasons for that, that we don't have to get into right now but like so yes, but I do, but I th- I think it's a pivot that they would go to here and there. Whereas as of now, he never pivots to Randall at the five because that's like completely like there, there's just no we just know he's not going to do that. Towns is at least seven foot. He's um, at least seven feet. Yeah, yeah, and doesn't have. I think if I'm remembering correctly, Randall's wingspan is either even or negative to his body, and that's not the case for towns so there's there's a little bit more of a rim protection aspect just from being bigger but like we know how much tibbs values that and i would say unless they also lost hartenstein then i couldn't see him playing a ton of center well if i if they yeah that would be bad if they lost isaiah hartenstein um so yeah i mean look uh, we'll see what happens if it if it if rumor starts to come out and it gets more serious, I'll spend more time thinking about it then, but it is interesting. And then like, so I'm with you that like, I think like, what do they need to find? They need to find an Emmanuel quickly type to replace the Emmanuel quickly type that they lost. The problem is like you scour the league and like, you could, you could find guys who can support second unit offenses, but like, I, I don't know about you. I'm sure you spent some time thinking about possible targets for them, but like I, I will, I'll come across like a certain player and I'll be like, well, that guy's too good to be coming off the bench. If they acquire this player, he's going to want to start. And let, let's, we could spend a second on this. I've maybe irrationally so just fallen in love with Dante DiVincenzo as a starting two guard. And I, I think the fit and just everything he brings to the offense and like being the, the, with OG again, usually guarding the best player on the opposing team, having Dante have a little bit more of like a Roma role, get, you know, he's good, like 
jumping at the passing lanes, that kind of stuff. Like, I love that fit. And I'm really not sure I want to break that up for a- anyone that I see being available. I don't know if you do you feel the same way. I mean, I think that the reason that you feel that way is because he essentially morphed into prime Clay Thompson <laughs> from the time that Randall and OG got like he did. Like, I wrote about it in the playoffs. Like, look at the numbers. It's basically like the peak of Clay's career is what Dante was doing through that stretch. And the the combination of movement shooting and volume shooting and the ability to get the shot off so quickly when you have guys who can create even the slightest bit of advantages is it's so valuable. And and I agree. Like I wouldn't break it up break up that unit for just anybody. Like I, I wouldn't say like, oh, you know, we're we're getting like a guy who's a little bit better than Dante. He has to start at the two now. Like that that's not something that I would be all that interested in. Like if you got a guy who was, you know, like a star two guard and said like, all right, you know, Dante is going to come off the bench because Devin Booker is going to start. I was about to say he's the, uh, he's the name. Like, and I don't think Devin Booker is going anywhere this summer. So yeah, uh, I was surprised. I was listening to you guys do the, the off season draft <laughs> that yeah. you had. First of all, unhinged <laughs> doesn't even begin to describe what that was like. <laughs> It was extremely unhinged. Yeah. I was surprised nobody had him as their guy to get because that's the guy Who, I've Booker? been talking about. Yeah. Oh, no, I excluded him. That's why nobody nobody got him. I, I uh. excluded a particular list of of stars that I was like, these guys are not remotely on the table. And he was one of the guys that over that part. Okay. All yeah, right. Now that makes fine. sense. That's been my guy for like two years now. I... Again, we're bouncing around. Let's talk about Phoenix for a second because it seems like I get asked again a lot about Phoenix. I'm sure you get asked a lot about Phoenix too. It seems like Budenholzer's Budenholzer is that's like that's their move for this year. And I'm kind of in a all right. Well, let's see how next season goes for Phoenix, and then we'll revisit that that speculation a year from now. Like I, I, I don't see them doing anything crazy, even with Durant, right? No, I mean, I don't either. Um, they're kind of limited, obviously, in what they could do due to the, with their salary structure. Um, and obviously, Beal has a no trade, so he's not going anywhere unless he wants to. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I think Beal is the first guy to actually get a no trade since Kobe Bryant, if I'm remembering. Oh, I was going to say Mello. You, you, I think you're right. It is Kobe. Because Mel- Mello to, was earlier. Well, Mello also like you have to sign a new contract with the team to get it. So I think that last Kobe deal was the last one. Maybe yeah. it was maybe Mello's was after because you can't get a no trade and an extension. You have to actually hit free agency after being with a team for four years and in the league for eight years. Either way, it's it was a decade or close to a decade when at the time they gave it to him, which is which was crazy. It was so crazy. <laughs> Man, I, what 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 contract would you rather have right now, Bradley Beal or Zach Levine? Um, Levine, because it, you can move it if you want to. That's true. <laughs> okay, yeah, I I wonder how successful Chicago's Chicago's going to be in in moving moving that. But like, j- just to bring it back to the Knicks, like again, Zach Levine is a guy who in the past has been speculated about, like in connection to the Knicks. Like now, putting aside the fact that he had a really you can be pickier than in the past, I think. Like by far. Um, and then the other part of it, and it, again, just to like to bring it back to Divincenzo, the dude's making twelve million dollars a year for the next three seasons. And now that the Knicks are, and this will transition into because I want to talk about like OG. Um, now that the Knicks are like creeping up into apron territory, and like I don't know. I personally, I'd be shocked if they were in. I think the challenge. I, I think first apron, like they're going to go into the first apron this year. I think the challenge is going to be just they got to stay below the second apron, which I think they could do. Um, you know, so like the notion that oh, we could get like Zach Levine for nothing. Well, that's great. He makes forty, an average of forty five million dollars over the next three years. Like that's not where you want to be putting your your eggs, right? Yeah, and I think that like I, I, on, I think you. I don't remember if you were on Fred's podcast or he was on your podcast where you guys were talking about um, how trading for towns would affect the salary in the future. Um, And it severely restricts what you're able to do. 
Um, I, I don't expect that they'll be above the second apron next year. And the first apron is basically uh, like, are they bringing Bogdanovich back or not? Um, basically, yeah. Yeah. Like if they are, then they're going to likely be over it at least unless or until they move him. And if they're not, then I don't know. It's, it's kind of difficult to see them getting over uh, unless they use like the full or close to the full mid-level again. I don't, yeah, no, and and I and again, like the if you use the full mid level, full mid level, it hard capture with the first apron, so you can't even. Oh right, yeah, you, you can't even do that. No, but that's but again, the Bogdanovich point. This is how I find this stuff fascinating because all this stuff ties together. We're talking about okay, who, what what peach can they get to come off the bench? It's a playmaker and yada yada yada. What other salary are you moving to acquire that that piece? It's basically Bogdanovich. Like that is your way to acquire that player, and it's just you know it it, it really does like. For as much as they're coming off a successful year, and we're all excited about this thing moving forward, like th- I think there's a fair amount of pressure on this front office to have a, a a pretty like it's a big couple of weeks for them coming up. Yeah, I mean, like, look, they're their best defender, they're either second or third best defender and starting center. They are both free agents and can leave if they want to. They've got a Chua's restricted free agency. They've got Bogdanovich's. A uh, non guarantee or partial guarantee sitting out there. Like Burks is a free agent. Not that he's necessarily like a key piece, but you know, if you lose somebody unexpected, you might want to bring him back. They've got three draft picks. Like Burks is Burks is uh, pretty important against Indiana. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, but no. like to be in a situation where Alec Burks is really important in a series is not a situation that you want to be in, and that's part of the reason that I really want to see them use at least two that's- of these three draft picks and like you know what you can get with the 25th pick in the draft you can get an emmanuel quickly type i know that because he was taken with the 25th pick in the draft like yes uh they've had some i mean quite grimes i know it didn't work out in the end but um he, he was pretty good as well i want to talk about og for a second because i i i find it so the situation with him where you know there are numbers like you're, you, you, we see tossed around and and potential contracts and stuff. I'm kind of of the position that like, look, if they could get him for a number that is more team friendly, I don't even know what that would mean at this point. But like, great, but like they made their bet on this contract or this negotiation the day they traded for him. Like they, there is no world where they can like let him walk. Are you kind of a, or, do, or do you disagree with that? No, like they can, they cannot <laughs> let him walk. Okay, like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not like they could suddenly open up a bunch of cap space. Exactly, yeah. That, like, without doing something like trading Randall into someone's space, like th- there's just no way. Like he's the best defender on the team. He's a perfect fit. Like they they traded a, a lot to get him. You know, they tr- they traded quickly in RJ and uh, like. I think what became the 31st or 32nd pick uh, Detroit 30, had the worst pick, yeah. record in the league. Yeah. So, you know, they, they traded a pretty decent amount there to get him. And there's a reason they were chasing after him for two years. It's because he is the guy that they needed, you know, like I, I'm still of the belief that he's going to be back in New York. Like I know that there's been minor rumblings, I guess I would say over the last few days about, good, good term for but like, I, I, I kind of feel like this was agreed upon before it was agreed upon, if that makes sense. Um, so I hope so. I, but yeah, I'm with you. Like you cannot let him leave for nothing. Yeah. Like, that cannot happen. I do find it interesting because, like, the only team I, I go by Keith Smith's uh, salary cap projections because Keith is freaking amazing, and like the only team that has more than thirty five, the only teams who that have more than thirty five million in space um, this summer are Detroit, who. I, 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 I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm not really worried about Detroit stealing away. I don't know, no, no disrespect to Detroit, even though we make fun of them a lot on this pod. Um, and then Philly and the Philly situation is like <clears throat> kind of fascinating to me as well, because they have to do something, right? Like they have to, they have to do something. And like, I, I look at it as like, you know, a name we haven't, said half an hour into this podcast is Joel Embiid because there have been no rumblings and also Joel Embiid's like public enemy number one around here after the first round series. But like if I if that if they can't figure out a way to make something happen there, like it, it's only a matter of I would think it's only a matter of time before he starts getting antsy as well. So I think the 
is that what is your most fascinating offseason thing that you're looking at team that you're looking at? Um, that's a good question that I haven't really thought about. I mean, I guess it's sort of by default has to be the Sixers just because of how much is up in the air there. And they have a guy who, you know, was the MVP last year and looked like he could have been on his way to another one this year, but also like you never know when that run's going to end as we've seen from the majority of his career. Um, but I think like San Antonio too, like they've got some space. Obviously they have Wembanyama, they have two top eight picks. Like I very much want to know what's going to happen there. They're if they didn't have the Zach Collins contract, which hasn't his that extension hasn't even kicked in yet. They owe him like $35 million over the next two years. I'm unless I'm mistaken, it's fully guaranteed They're They were like a low key, like man, Hardenstein would look good in, in that situation. Like he could play just enough to give Wemby a break from always playing full-time center, but the Collins contract is there. So I'm not really too worried about that. Is there, have I you thought also, I think they yeah, also like, they discovered pretty early in the season, like Wemby needs to play center. That's yeah, he, he's he's better there. And like also OKC is another team that has a bunch of space, and you know they played Chet at the five like every basically almost every minute that Chet was on the court for them this year. Like, do they want to deviate from that to go spend what it's going to take to sign a center away? So like, I'm not, I'm not too worried about Harden just because I don't know if I see the team out there that's going to give him. The big payday. Have you thought at all about like a team that you're worried about signing away? You think he's going to be back? Yeah, I mean, the issue is that there's a number or a lot of numbers that the Knicks just can't meet. So all it all it takes is one team to say, "Here's 110 million dollars," and then it's like, "Are you really passing up like 40 million or something like that?" Like, I wouldn't. I'm that. also you know not in the NBA and. It, and all it takes is one team. Maybe like, you know, Detroit has Jalen Duran. What if they do it anyway? Troy Weaver's not there, but they've been collecting centers for years. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, Charlotte could have a bunch of cap space. What if it's them? Like, you know, Oklahoma City, they ha- obviously didn't want to play Chet at the four last year. It sort of deviated from, like you said, what their, their overall team philosophy was. What if they view Hartenstein as a guy that doesn't force them to deviate from that because of the way he's able to move the ball and operate in space. You know, like there are any number of teams that could talk themselves into it. And there are also teams that don't have space right now, but could based on trades that happen between now and, you know, and, and free agency. Like, you know, you mentioned the the number of teams that have upwards of 35 million in space, like Utah can get there. Not that difficultly um, based on renouncing a bunch of guys, but you know, I would, I'd imagine that they're gonna renegotiate and extend Larry Markkinen, but that only takes up uh, a bunch of it and not all of it. Hey, again, you just because you said his name, I'll, I'll ask about him because like that's another name that I know. Like XJ here with us, next film school has been a long time massive fan of Larry Markkinen. I, he's but he he's one of those guys where. I love the New Jerseys, by the way. I don't, I'm sure you saw the pick of the. They're the, great, especially the in comparison with the ones they wore well, the last two years, which were like somehow even worse than Oklahoma City. Like Oklahoma City is the least creative jerseys in the league. The the Jazz went a level back past that because it was they were actively bad. Um, these I like. I love the purple though, and I think they got some cool designs there. But like marketing is. Like it seems like they want to like build around him, or at the very least, like hang on to him at all costs. And yet, it seems like people are always trying to put his name in in trades. And I just, I just don't see that as realistic. I don't know if you disagree. Yeah, I mean, it's realistic if you want to meet Danny Ainge's price, because as we know from the Donovan Mitchell negotiations, like, and this is what you know everybody who's dealt with Danny over the years says, like, he sets his price, and if you want to meet it, great. If you don't, he's going somewhere else. You're not going to get your player. Yeah, that's just kind of the way things have worked historically. Like maybe it's different now. Probably it's not like I understand the, the fascination because it's like, if you shifted Randall's playmaking and driving skill to more shooting and like pull up shooting essentially is what you would get with marketing. Um, and not as good a rebounding or things like that, but yeah, you'd, like, you'd lose some of the physicality I think with him in place, but you'd gain some other stuff too. Right. I, I understand it. Certainly. I can't see like if the Knicks weren't willing to meet the price for Mitchell, if they're not willing to meet the price for some of these, like 
I can't see necessarily it coming to fruition, but I understand it. Like I, I get it. There's been people that have brought that idea to me in the past too. And like, I like it conceptually, but in practice, you actually have to make a trade and that's where things get difficult. So, as is often the case in the NBA, um, a couple more and then I'm going to get you out of here. Uh, just before we go to the, I'm going to ask you about the draft, but before that, is there a player like a, a guy who, again, not a star player, but a guy you think is attainable for not an insane cost that, you, you know, maybe whether it's the Bogdanovich contract or, um, well, probably would be the Bogdanovich contract who you either have had your eye on, or you think would be a good fit, like on the Knicks bench unit or, um, like a guy, like I like Caruso, but like, who the hell wouldn't like Caruso? He's a freaking awesome basketball player. And at the same time, I love him. He's not exactly answering the Knicks questions. Like he's not a man quickly. He's not going to, to generate offense when Jalen Brunson's out on the floor. He's an awesome basketball player. But like, I, I guess the reason I'm asking you is because I've, I've kind of, I've gone through the whole league and I'm like, I don't know. Like again, go back to Danny Ainge. Like Colin Sexton. Like Colin Sexton would be really good off the bench. Like he's feisty defender, and like he's kind of learned to shoot. But like that's going to cost a lot in assets. So I don't know. Do you have your your eye on anybody or anybody curious to you? Not really, honestly. Like the market isn't much different now than it was at the deadline because no moves have been made since then, and you know there there weren't necessarily the best guys available at that point. I mean, I think that the best guy available was the guy, the other guy that they were interested at the deadline is Bruce Brown. Bruce Brown. Yeah. Like he makes a lot of sense in a lot of different ways and not just because he's my guy from the U, but like he's, he's obviously like a very Tibbsy type of player. He's played backup point guard. He's played the two, the three and the four, even the five at times, essentially like he makes some degree of sense. He's like, and we've seen him run a second unit offense for a title team. He's and also not like going to be the primary engine of that offense. You know, like it's not a guy that you can put at the top of the court and say, run, you know, 30 pick and rolls per hundred possessions with the bench unit. That's not really what you're getting with him. So even that is a necessarily drive, a though. perfect fit. He does a, drive he, for sure. He does, you know, which is like, again, it's a little thing, but like, what do what do we keep seeing from these Nick perimeter players? What do they keep emphasizing? Drive the basketball, you know? And it's like, that's leads to offensive rebounds and the whole thing. I, again, I wrote it last week. I is like, I went through some like f- starrier, you know, names. And at the end I was like, and if all else fails, Bruce Brown, I, I don't know what the odds I could get right now. on like the, that is the Nick's biggest move of the summer, but I would put a few bucks on it if I could get decent odds. Yeah, I mean, I could, I could see it. I wouldn't say it's their, you know, first choice or anything. No, but, um, but it makes sense. Like for all the same reasons, it made sense at the deadline. Um, and you know, they they tried Bogdanovich and Burks instead. It worked to a degree. Good degree. It didn't work to a degree. <laughs> like for most of the regular season, it didn't work. For a bunch of the playoffs, it didn't work because Bogdanovich got hurt and Burks didn't come in until later. But one of my friends was like very adamant that Burks needed to be playing earlier. <laughs> and I was like, I'm okay with it because, first of all, they, they won those games. Second of all, and that's to me, that's all that matters in the playoffs. I don't care if guys play big minutes as long as they don't get hurt, which then obviously happened with basically everybody. But Burks had played poorly enough after the trade that it was justifiable to me that he wasn't like even on the fringes of the rotation. Obviously he stayed ready, played really well. So it worked out, but that doesn't mean that if he had played starting in the previous series that he would have been good. Like it's not like it's not the same thing. As I've said, he, and I love Alec Burks, but he was like actively bad. Um, you know, in a lot of his stints, they should have kept Malachi Flynn. That was that was the <laughs> the, the, the one that got away. Um, all right, last thing, really quick before I get you out of here, uh, the draft because I know you've looked at the draft a little bit at least uh, more, which more than I have. Um, I'm starting to do my homework. I know um, I had Michael Scotto on the pod last week who reported Nick's interest in Ryan Dunn, um, who uh, I guess in, Instagrammed, yeah, Instagrammed, grammed. Do you do? Gr- what is the verbiage with like? Do you gram something? Do you insta something? I guess you post on Instagram, right? You like that's what it. I would say. That's that's the but proper way. As opposed I'm to being also, an idiot. We're both old. Like you know, I'm 37. 
you're i believe around my age like i'm a little older but yeah i'll take I, we don't have to say the number um whatever he did he did he was at the next practice facility today um is there by the way i agree with you i think it's important that they make at least one of these picks um and i'd like them to make more than one of these picks um the two times they've made picks under the leon rose uh regime putting aside the Trevor Keels year, like those guys have played for them in those seasons, like Grimes played, like Deuce wasn't a big part of the rotation. We played obviously Obi and quickly played when they drafted those guys. Um, Is there someone that like you like, or you have your eye on for around where, where they're picking? I haven't done a lot of work on like the back of the first round guys yet. So the only one I really know a lot about is just because he went to Miami is Keyshawn George. Okay. Is he's like, if he turned into everything you wanted him to turn it into, he would be actually like a really good fit for what the Knicks need. It's like righty Joe Ingles, basically. That's who fun. is the guy that can like really shoot. Like he shot over 40% from three. He has great form shot from really deep. He's a really, really, really good passer because until a couple of years ago, he was like five ten, and now he's like six, seven in the span oh, wow. of like three okay. years. Like, and he played some point guard at Miami this year because basically everybody on the team got hurt. So like, if he turned into what you wanted to turn into, it would be really good. The issue is he is like very unathletic, like Ingles style unathletic. Um, So that, that could be obviously a bit of an issue, but to me, it's like, it's guards who can create for others, whether that's off the drive or just being really good passers, or if they get the sense that they're going to lose Hartenstein, they're probably going to need to find a center, depending on what they're going to do with Achua in that situation. Like, is he just going to be the backup center? I'm, um, I'm interested but, in, in the Achua restricted free agency because, like, I there's a good NBA player there, but, like, the, the conversation that happened around here, like, over the course of the last bunch of months is, like, does, is he a guy that like needs to be in an NBA rotation or is he just like an elite depth piece where if he is in your rotation, like you're, you're, you're good, you're fine with that. But like, if you start counting on him for 15, 20 minutes a night, like, you know, it gets a little dicier, you know? Yeah. I think that's probably where I am, where it's like, if he, if he needs to play 15 to apparently 48 minutes, <laughs> <laughs> um yes. that can happen but if you're count like this is something that i used to say about oddly enough jr smith oh. not because of the playing time but because of his skill set jr smith was a player who could do literally anything you needed him to do on the backcourt he had every single club in his bag but yeah. when you needed him to use them it was not good if all you needed him to do was shoot threes and defend like he did in Cleveland, he was a good player, like legitimately a very good player in that specific situation. When you needed him to create, when you needed him to do stuff about the dribble, when you needed him to carry a high usage rate, when you needed him to be in your rotation, even if he wasn't hitting shots, like with the Knicks or with the Nuggets or with the, the New Orleans Hornets, that's when it was not good. Like I think so. somewhat similarly about Achua. If, if he's there and you can use him, great. If you need him to be a night to night contributor. I think we saw in Miami and in Toronto and with the Knicks, it's not necessarily something you're going to get like consistently high level play from him. And when you're trying to win at the level, the Knicks are hopefully trying to win at, like you don't want to put players on the court that you don't know are going to be good. That's one of the big things that they had going for them this year is every time they put somebody on the court, it was a guy they knew was going to play well. Yeah, and like to their credit, like in the in the games that you're referencing where Chua played like 48 minutes, like they to as as much as they could, I think they did a good job of putting him in a position to be successful. Like Deuce, like we didn't even talk about Deuce, but like Deuce was awesome, but he was I think put in now and also, but he also helped himself. Like that dude improved his game massively. I think over the course, I mean, the shooting thing, I still can't believe that that actually happened. That he turned into the shooter that he that he turned into um i'm waiting for someone to pinch me and i wake up but um <laughs> yeah anything else before we go i feel like we covered a lot of ground but is there anything else you did we we didn't that you want to touch on i don't think specifically off the top of my, like i'm trying to think if there's anything we didn't go to 
guess where where are you at with Randall these days? Like, there's a big decision that needs to be made there. Oh yes, and Andrew's reminding me. Finals talk. Um, I I am in camp, Randall. Uh, I'm in camp. I'm I'm definitely in camp, Randall. I would love to see him. I mean, I you know January happened. I really enjoyed that stretch of play from all parties involved, including Julius. Um, I do think. I do think the extension discussions will be interesting. Um, and I wonder if the two sides are going to be able to come to a, a decent number because I like Julius on a slightly smaller number than I do at what would be his max, I guess, four for 182. But like, I think Julius, like, I'll say this, like, again, we've talked about a lot of different options and, you know, you, there's a lot of imperfect options out there. Like I know Julius could work with this group because I saw it. it. Granted, it wasn't over the longest stretch of time um, in terms of this version of the team with OG and Anobi, but like I'm, I'm, I'm Team Randall. Are you? Yeah, I'm pretty much in the same spot. Like I think he's obviously like a really good player, and there are things that he does that the Knicks really, really need. He's maybe like just to the side or just shy of what they really, really need. Yes, is where I. Agree I with that would say, you know, like, and that's a really difficult spot to be in, you know, and organizationally on a personal standpoint, having Randall be unhappy with not getting a contract extension is not necessarily where I think the Knicks would want to be because we've seen what happens when he's not like a hundred percent at his most content and it's not pretty. Um, so I think that that's an interesting inflection point. Would I love him being extended at the number that it would take? Probably not, but like, tough, you know, all roads lead back to towns, my friend, (laughs) but even that, like that's an even more astronomical number, like you're locking yourself in even more. No, it is. And you, if again, if you make that move and you give up a guy like Julius who comes with just the known production and the known, like, I know he's got injured the last two years, but like that dude, he's out there. He, and th- like, he may have a bad game. If you play against the Knicks and he's in there, you're going to feel it the next day. And that's part of their identity. And that's a big part of, of who they are. And, um, yeah, if you make that swap, you better man, you better be right about it. Um and and have a plan to make sure that it works. Um okay, uh, we'll end on the finals. Uh I'm rooting for Dallas. Um, um I don't know if that's a hot That's not it's not even a take. I don't know if that's a controversial uh stance uh cuz I, I I like Luka Doncic. I I've, I've been pretty upfront about that. I like I like Luka. I like watching Luka play. Um the Porzingis part of it is going to be interesting. I I don't I'm not like phased by the fact that he's in the finals playing for the Celtics or whatever. I do think that he is the pivot point of the entire series though. And that's not, that is not a hot take because of uh, like all the different things involved with him on both ends. Um, Give me something you're again, looking forward to watching in the finals, a matchup, maybe uh, a coaching thing, like anything that you're, that you're interested in. Yeah. So one of the things that I uh, wrote about from my newsletter at last night basketball today, when I sent it out about the finals is when you look at, Kyrie's playoffs so far, the one series where he didn't contribute as much offensively was the one against Oklahoma City because he spent most of that series guarding Jalen Williams. And that is a much different challenge for him physically than guarding James Harden in the first round or Mike Conley in the Western Conference Finals. And he was able to do much more offensively in those two series. So depending on who Dallas has him guard, I'm going to be really interested to see if he can help Luca offensively to the extent that he has in two of their three series so far, like, is it too taxing for him to chase Derek white all over the court and do what he does offensively? Or is it too taxing for him physically to guard Jalen Brown and do what he does offensively? That's something that I think a lot of people haven't really talked about, but just looking back through the series that they've played so far, um, I thought that was a really interesting point that I hadn't seen discussed. It's a great call and it's a, it's a good reminder that it's like, it's not, it's not only about whether 
you can be hunted in the traditional sense when we talk about like, all right, who, who's the smallest guy on the floor, bring him into the pick and roll or, or whatever. It's a, it's about the impact that it has on the other end. And when you're a team that's built like the Mavs and they have the, the, like these two alphas and, and then everybody else kind of feeds off of that, which is, which is why, I mean, like, it feels like they're going to need a, is this going to be a, like a PJ Washington series? Is this going to be like a Derek Jones Jr. series? Are they like, I, I don't know. And is that too much to ask? Maybe, maybe that's the big thing. Is that too much to ask of those role players to step up and, and have big performances? Yeah. I mean, I think it needs to be all of their series. Like it's the, it's the finals, you know, like it's gotta be everybody's series on both teams. Like I think also what you mentioned about, you know, go hunting, like, Dallas is built to go hunting offensively with Luka and Kyrie. Like that is what their offense is built to do. Boston's is not built to do that. And when they get sucked into kind of that kind of game is when that offense tends to bog down. Like they should be hunting situations more than players. Like, can we get PJ Washington to be the backline help? Can we draw Luka into space? Can we get Daniel Gafford away from the rim? That kind of thing, rather than like, who are we going to target one on one? That's not necessarily like that's when Boston's offense bogs down, unless it's KP posting up with shooters right in his line of sight. Yeah, but that that's they, they, they built that in, and that's part of I think like, and they could do that like in the flow of what they do. I, I keep coming back to like, if Boston loses this series, not that they will have to play poorly, but like. If they play to their capabilities, they, there's just no way that they should lose the series. I just I don't see how they do. And I say this as someone who's picked Dallas in in seven because I just I can't I can't bring myself to pick against Luca. Uh, it'll probably come back to bite me in the ass. But yeah, that's that's where I'm at. Do you have a pick? I mean, look, the the way that Dallas wins is Luca goes supernova, right? Like yeah. we saw it a couple of years ago with Steph in the finals against Boston. That's that true. Boston team wasn't as good as this one, but we also know like the best player in the series is on Dallas, right? Like he is the best player in the series. And if he hits a level that they just can't reach, that is the way Dallas wins, you know? Yeah. Um, best player in the finals, uh, Wins it a, a decent number, amount of time. Not always, not always, but it, it does happen. Uh, we'll see. I'm excited for it to get started. I'm excited to read your coverage of the finals um, and your coverage of everything this summer and just everything they do produce because it's all um, A plus work and in a in a sea of uh, content about the NBA. Uh, it takes a lot to like stand out, and you've been doing it for a long time, and it's just. I don't know. Well, never disappoints. So, <laughs> um, no. I mean, I seriously, appreciate you saying that, man. I do. And uh, you know, you know what? We didn't touch on with the Knicks the what? pivot from Kentucky Wildcats to Villanova <laughs> Wildcats that I sent you an email about. That's when the Knicks started getting better. <laughs> I mean, they kept it in the with the same cat, you know. Um, so. I guess that's fine. Uh, I don't even know. Is there a Vill- is there a Villanova player available in this draft? Is there, is that- you know, there's there's not certainly not a notable one that also plays in New York. Um, no, I did notice that your guy though, uh, George. It, my, it, look, according to Tankathon here, is mocked to go twenty seven. So hey, listen, it's pretty close, right? It could yeah. happen. He's not quite a wildcat, but you know, <laughs> he's, no, he's not quite a wildcat. But what, what's it's? Uh, I mean. Uh, it's. I, I was gonna say like the the because I think of the mascot. And the mascot is a is a is a bird, but it's the hurricanes, obviously. So. Yeah, it's a an ibis because ibis, those you. are the yes. the only birds that don't flee in hurricanes, which I found out when I went to school there. I've learned something new today. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm here for, you know? That yes. and referencing the other time the Knicks had a Miami point guard, which was Shane Larkin, and it did not work out. He was there for one year, right? That was a Phil Jackson trade. Yeah. Yeah. He uh he's actually like one of the best players in Europe now, which, you know, for him. Yeah, I know. Good for him. Uh all right. Uh, I, I gotta run. Uh, I'm sure you gotta run to uh just I've we've said it a few times, but just let folks know where they could uh, find you. Yeah, it's uh just last night in basketball.com. That's that's where 
the significant majority to somewhere close to all of my basketball work is these days. I pop up every now and again at a bunch of different places, but that's where most of it is. Um, go subscribe to that if you're listening and you haven't already subscribed. Again, it's a great read and uh, you'll be happy you did. Uh, yeah, it's always a pleasure, man. Uh, I will touch base uh, maybe if the Knicks do some stuff this summer. We'll have to talk about it again. Sounds good, man. Thanks for having me.